Um, so hi everyone, my name is Jurek and I'm going to talk about efficient neural ranking using forward indexes. And this is joint work with Kostav, Mega, Abhijit and Abhishek. Um, so I just want to take a couple of minutes here to talk about uh, the approaches people usually have when they do retrieval and ranking in practice. So the first one is called uh, the uh, retrieve then rank approach. And the idea here is that you have these two steps and uh, you have uh, as a first step, a very fast um, sparse or lexical retrieval model such as BM25. And what that does is basically just uh, retrieves a bunch of candidate documents from your inverted index. And in the second step, you have a re-ranking model, which is uh, a bit more involved. So let's say this could be a BERT model these days, which is a bit slower, but it takes all of your candidate documents along with the query, and then it produces your final uh, ranking that you can use in your downstream task, for example. And then on the other hand, you have dense retrieval, um, where the idea is that you have these uh, dual encoder models. Uh, so you have a document encoder, which takes all of the documents in your corpus and it maps them to this uh, vector space. So something like this. And uh, similarly, you have a query encoder model, which does the same thing with the query in the same vector space, uh, which could look something like this. Um, and then in order to do retrieval, you simply do this um, nearest neighbor search or approximate nearest neighbor search. Um, and you just return the uh, documents that are closest to this query uh, in your vector space. Um, and these models are also called semantic matching models, for example, because they usually have some sort of semantic matching capabilities. Um, and under the hood, they kind of look like this. Um, so in order to compute your dense or semantic matching score, we call this phi d, um, you just simply take a dot product of your query representation and your document representation. So these are two vectors. Um, and the dot product is basically your score. And you use the dot product because it kind of encodes the proximity of these two vectors uh, in the vector space. Um, and the nice thing about this dense retrieval is actually that you can do a lot of pre-computations, right? So if you want to do index or uh, indexing, all you have to do is uh, simply pre-compute the document representations for all the documents in your corpus, which is this eta of D here. Um, and that is basically your index. Um, and then finally, we have hybrid retrieval, which is um, like a combination of both, right? So you have two retrievers and you get two sets of documents. Um, and then you simply combine these two sets and that is your final ranking. <clears throat> um, so now we can actually look at the motivation for this work. Um, so here I have a couple of uh, results on the track deep learning document ranking data set. Uh, so at the top here, we have BM25, which is just sparse retrieval without any re-ranking or anything at all, right? So this is very fast and it also has a very good recall. Um, however, if you look at the NDCG and you see that the ranking in the end is actually not so good. Um, below that you have dense retrieval, which um, is of course a lot slower than sparse retrieval. And also the recall is not as good. Um, so it's not as good at actually selecting all the uh, relevant documents in the first place. Um, but the NDCG is already a lot higher than um, for sparse retrieval. And uh, below that you have re-ranking, which corresponds to this retrieve then rank approach from earlier. Um, and the main thing here is that we are actually using the same models here that we also used for dense retrieval, right? So we have these TCT Colbert and ANTS, um, but we are not using them for dense retrieval. Instead, we are just using them for re-ranking of these um, BM25 candidate documents. Um, and this is kind of the main takeaway here and the main motivation from our work, because you can see that the results with this are actually uh, really good, right? So you had very good NECG values. And of course you have the recall from the BM25 retrieval. Um, so this is, yeah, the main takeaway from this and the main motivation for us. Um, and then finally we have interpolation based re-ranking, which is pretty much the same as the other re-ranking. The only difference is that instead of just discarding this um, sparse score, this phi s here, um, we just keep that and we compute the final ranking, this phi in blue here, by um, creating a linear interpolation of the sparse score phi s and the dense or semantic re-ranking score phi d. And um, yeah, as you can see, you get a little bit better results with this. Um, so our work is called fast forward indexes. Um, and the idea is that we want to do efficient interpolation based re-ranking. 
Um, and we also want to do this just on CPUs. So we do not want to require any GPU acceleration or anything. Uh, it should be just on CPUs and it should be fast enough to actually use in uh, production. Um, so the idea is quite simple. This is the same equation as earlier. Um, and what we are focusing on is this part here. So this is the computation of the dense um, semantic re-ranking scores, um, because this is usually the bottleneck. Um, so if you consider a traditional approach, then you would have some re-ranking model, maybe BERT. And if you have a query and you want to re-rank maybe 100 documents, what you have to do is uh, you have to perform 100 forward passes, right? And this is very slow. Um, what we are doing is we are exploiting the fact that um, we just found out that uh, you can actually use these dual encoders um, for re-ranking and they give very good performance. So what we do is we use these dual encoders. Um, and as, as I said earlier, uh, you can do all these pre-computations, right? So in the end, we are computing the score as before. We're just taking the dot product of the two representations. Um, but since we can pre-compute all these document representations, um, all we have to do to re-rank the documents for a query is a single forward pass, which is the encoding of the query. And then all the document vectors, we can just look up in our index. So a fast forward index is basically just a lookup table or a hash table for these document representations. Um, and once we have that, we can just compute 100 dot products. And then we have all of our re-ranking scores. <clears throat> And um, just to give you an idea of how much faster this can be, we have, uh, um, we have a comparison here of these three approaches. So the first one is just normal re-ranking. Then we have re-ranking, but with interpolation. And then finally, interpolation-based re-ranking again. But instead of computing the forward passes, we just do this lookup technique and uh, re-rank using our fast forward indexes. Um, and as you can see, of course, the performance is almost the same for the three. Um, but if you look at the latency on average for one query, you can see that this is actually much faster. Um, so in the remainder of this talk, I'm going to introduce two techniques that we have for interpolation-based re-ranking using these fast forward lookup indexes. Um, and they are uh, actually supposed to make this even more efficient and even more faster. So for the first one, I have to introduce another concept, which is called MaxP indexes. Um, and I'm sure everyone knows this, but the idea is very simple. Uh, you have uh, long documents. And what people usually do is uh, they chunk these long documents into multiple passages. So one document ends up having multiple vector representations. Um, and in order to compute the score for this document, uh, you simply compute the scores for every passage of this document, and then you take the maximum, and that's your document score. Um, now, our intuition here is actually that uh, probably there's a lot of redundancy if you do it like this, right? So if you have a document which has a lot of representation, then the chances are probably high that some of these representations are unnecessary. Um, so what we do here is we propose uh, an approach which we call sequential coalescing to reduce the number of representations of one document. So it's kind of an index compression technique. <clears throat> and uh, the idea is, uh, again, simple. We just uh, iterate through all these passages um, in the same uh, order as they appear in the original document. So here on the left side, we have an example, and I'm going to walk you through that. So we start um, by going to the first passage, which we call P0 here. Um, and um, we always compare two adjacent passages. So we have P0 and P1, and we compute the distance. So in this case, this would be cosine distance. And these two are close together. So the distance is kind of small. Um, so it does not exceed a threshold that we have, which we call delta. Um, and since it does not exceed the threshold, we just combine these passages by taking the average. Um, and then we maintain kind of this running average, which is just all the passages we have combined so far. Um, and then we just go to the next passage, P2. And again, they are close. So we merge them. And uh, next one, P3, is actually far away. So the distance is larger than this threshold. So in this case, we just keep the passage that we just combined as it is. And we start over. So P3, and then we go to P4, which is again far away. So we do nothing. Same with P5. 
And then finally, P5 and P6 are close again, so we combine them. Uh, now we're done. So essentially what we've done here is we have compressed this index by almost 50%, right? So we went from seven representations to four. Um, so here I have a plot about the effect that this has. Um, so you can see in red, the size reduction. So this is kind of the degree of compression that you get when you vary this distance threshold delta. And in yellow, we have the corresponding NECG values. Um, and you can see there's of course a threshold between compression and performance, but the hit that you get in performance is not really that big. Okay, the second one is called early stopping. Um, and the intuition here is that um, usually when you have a downstream task, you do not need so many documents. So let's say you might have a QA task, then usually your model requires maybe the top five or the top 10 documents, but not more. Um, and what we have found empirically is that if you do this interpolation-based re-ranking and you have a set of candidate documents and you have these re-ranking scores, that usually these scores correlate to some extent. Which means if you go further and further down in the list of candidates, then it becomes less and less likely that your re-ranking model would give you a very high score, which would promote this document all the way to the top 10, maybe. Um, so what we argue here is that in many cases, it is not necessary to do re-ranking for all documents, but instead you can just stop earlier. And I'm going to show you an example here. Um, so here we just want the top three documents and we rank these documents by um, interpolation again, right? So we have the first three candidate documents here and these are ordered by a sparse score. So this is important. Um, and uh, what we do is of course, we compute the ranking scores for the top three documents first. And here it turns out we have to swap those actually. Um, and uh, now we just uh, have a look at the uh, next candidate documents here. And now the intuition is actually this. Uh, for these next documents, what we want to do is we want to compute the ranking scores that these documents can get in the best case. So for example, for this document D224, we already know the sparse score, which is 0.73. So the best case kind of um, corresponds to the highest dense re-ranking score this document can get. Um, now, unfortunately, we don't know this uh, score, <laughs> the highest in, uh, dense re-ranking score, because usually these are unbounded and unnormalized. Uh, but we, what we can do is we can just approximate this by simply taking the maximum score that we have observed so far, which would be 0.67 in this case. Um, so now what we do, we simply pretend that this document got this um, maximum 0.67, and then we see what happens. Um, so on the lower left, you can see the computation in this case. So we simply plug this 0.67 in for the uh, phi d. And the result, we, sim uh, we simply compare to 0.68 here, which is the blue number. And this number is what you kind of have to beat in order to reach the top three. Um, so in this case, actually, the uh, best case score is higher than 0.68. So in this case, we cannot stop yet. So we just keep going. We compute the real score. And actually, it turns out that this one goes in the top three. Um, but now for the next one, we do the same thing again. And here it turns out that the score in the best possible case is actually lower than 0.72. Um, so even in the best case, this document will not reach the top three. Um, and this is where we simply say, OK, we, here we can stop, because all these candidate documents are anyways ordered by the sparse retrieval score. So if you keep going, it will just get worse. right? Uh, all right, I'm going to skip this slide for time reasons. Um, so finally, we have the results here. Um, this is on the track deep learning document ranking task again, and we have a couple of baselines. So we have hybrid retrieval uh, and re-ranking, and then we have interpolation, which also includes our results under fast forward. Um, and we report the latency here, which is again, uh, the average rate, uh, latency it takes to process one query. And we have these numbers here on, on GPU and on CPU. Um, and then we have two scenarios basically where we uh, re-rank either 1000 documents, which is here in the middle, or we re-rank 5000 documents. Okay, so I'm just going to show you the main takeaways here from this table. So the first one is here, if you look at the NECG column, for example, 
um, then you can see that, okay, interpolation is better than re-ranking, which we already knew um, from the first results. And it is also a little bit better than hybrid retrieval. Um, and then you can compare these numbers to the right side for uh, re-ranking 5,000 documents. And of course, it's also not surprising, but um, if you have more candidate documents that you can re-rank, you will also get slightly better performance. Um, what's kind of the main takeaway here is that if you look at the latency numbers, then you can see that we are actually much faster than traditional re-ranking or interpolation-based re-ranking, right? So you have over one second on GPUs versus around 250 milliseconds for us on CPUs. Um, so this kind of makes it feasible to even re-rank as many as 5,000 documents in the first place. And then finally, uh, you can see that if we apply our compression technique coalescing, um, then we get a, a small performance hit as expected, but it's still kind of close to the original performance uh, and it's much faster. And then here, the same story. Um, this is on the passage ranking task. I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, the only difference is that instead of this coalescing technique here, we use uh, early stopping because we are only uh, requiring the uh, top 10 documents here for RR at 10. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up, please. Yes, actually, I'm done. So that's it. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to hear your questions. And if you're interested, uh, please have a look at our code, which is already on, on PyPI. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, this was a, a wonderful presentation. Um, so I don't see any questions uh, here in Zoom or in Whova, but I do have a quick question myself. Um, so it seems like this approach of, oh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, there's a uh, Sengar has a question. Um, so, uh, so Sengar can go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, I hope you can hear me, Yurek. Uh, thank you very much yes. for the great presentation. Uh, it was really impressive. Liked it a lot. Uh, maybe your last slide was a little bit in rush. So I want to uh, see it again and want to see after this early stopping, was there any, uh, any reasonable uh, or any considerable loss of performance, or was it uh, as good as the previous case? Because the numbers look quite similar to me at the first look, but it, but it was very fast. So even yeah. after early stopping, uh, it's almost, almost the same NDCG or effectiveness performance. Is it like that? Uh, thank you. Yeah, actually, it's identical. So here, uh, we don't have NDCG. We only have RR uh, at 10. But uh, yes, in fact, we get identical results. So in this case, it means our approximation was accurate, in fact, and we get just exactly the same with and without early stopping. So it, it, it was a like lucky kind of uh, feasible approximation, right? So even for different yes. metrics or different maybe cutoff thresholds, have you have you tried with like you know, at five, at ten, at twenty? Do you see any difference? I don't know. If you go at twenty, that does it uh, start to be a problem? Or... Um, actually, no, because the more you have, the more accurate it becomes. Um, uh -huh. The only thing is that, of course, if you keep going, then there will be more and more overhead. And at some yes. point, it kind of stops being useful. So let's say if you go maybe over 100, then at some point, it would be faster without early stopping, actually. Okay. But one, um, one, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank, thank you. And one, one little quick, quick question, if I have time. Uh, how yeah. about the performance uh, with the birds? So I'm a little bit surprised that uh, Bert is doing uh, really uh, bad in comparison to others in terms of effectiveness. Uh, do you have any explanation or insight for that, uh, just for the people who want to reproduce? Uh, yeah, actually, we were also a bit stumped by that. So um, actually, I have an explanation for this um, for this part, um, mm -hmm. because um, this is probably because of this max p approach um, that I. Uh, talked about earlier, um, because these um, TCT Cobalt and ANTS models, they uh, they use this max p approach. However, if we use BERT, uh, we only use the first passage of each document, basically. So BERT only ever sees the head of each document, because if we use BERT on all passages, it would be extremely slow. Um, so this might be one reason why it's bad. Um, why it's bad on the passages, it's also yeah not very clear to us. Um, it might just be a difference in training data, maybe. <laughs> 